Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone um, progressively joining us online. I trust that you are all safe, healthy and at home. Um, welcome to everybody to this session on ocean-based solutions in the fight against climate change. Uh, this is a session held as part of the Race to Zero Dialogues on the Ocean Day. So thank you to our organizers, the World Economic Forum, Friends of Ocean Action, the Blue Climate Initiative and Ocean and Climate Platform. My name is Lorelai Picourt. I'm the Secretary General of the Ocean and Climate Platform, and I am also the co-focal point for ocean and coastal zones under the Marrakesh Partnership. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and I will be your facilitator throughout the session. So if we may start with a very brief um, on logistics, a quick brief on logistics, so we can get it out of the way and go into the discussion. We, we hope this uh, session will be very interactive, so we invite you all to go to Slido and use the platform to ask your question. And you can see on the screen now, you can either go directly to the website and enter the hashtag race to zero or scan the QR code. And then we will come back to the questions during the, the Q&A session after the panel discussion. So now let's get down to business. We are at a crucial time now with the upcoming fifth year anniversary of the Paris Agreement that will take place in December this year. And it is more important than ever to reaffirm our ambition to tackle the climate crisis and to together embark on a race to zero emissions. As you may have heard in the opening session of this Ocean Dialogue this morning, the, the high level champions for global climate action are convening the Race to Zero Dialogues over two weeks to reflect on the progress that has been made in terms of mitigation and adaptation solutions. These discussions overall, they will serve as critical input to the UNFCCC Climate Dialogues that will take place from 23 of November to the 4th of December. With all these discussions and dialogues, what is the point? Well, the goal is, goal is to really catalyze actions on climate change to support the Paris Agreement. As you know, the clock is ticking. It's absolutely essential that now all civil society actors continue to join forces and continue to send governments a resounding signal that businesses, NGOs, cities, regions, and investors are united in shifting to a decarbonized economy and thus in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Of course, in this global discussion, we cannot forget that the ocean covers 71% of our planet and is at the crossroads of all challenges facing humanity today, from climate change to biodiversity loss, to the energy transition, to ensuring food security, and of course, as we all know, our global health. The ocean truly is one of the keys to the sustainable future that we must build. So now, um, to dive into the core of this session, we shall focus on nature-based solutions offered by our global ocean to not only address climate change, but also enhance resilience and ensure a just transition to a sustainable blue economy. We have an outstanding panel here today, um, of course, at a safe distance behind the computers, but still we will have a, a good discussion, I hope, on the ocean's potential to provide such solutions. So thank you all for being here. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jelen Lowellin, um, who will provide some opening remarks. Jilly, you are the Deputy Oceans Leader at WWF International, and you have dedicated your life's career to marine conservation and especially in, in coastal zones. It's an absolute honor to have you here with us. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laurelie. Um, and I'd like to start by explaining how the geological cycle and the carbon cycle uh, show us that oceans and coasts the layers of sediment they can contain and the rich web of life they support really are our planet's primary mechanism for storing carbon. Now this um, vital function in the race uh, to bend the curve of carbon emissions probably rarely uh, receives the attention it deserves. So with the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development starting in 50 short days, we have a chance really to shine a research spotlight on ocean and coasts as carbon sinks and equip our policymakers with powerful arguments for their restoration and protection. Now our blue forests and our blue gardens need to be cultivated as part of a oceans food climate virtuous solutions set and our deltas and our muddy silty and sandy sediments need to be protected from disturbance and protected from development so that their fundamental role literally as the sticky paper on which organic carbon is captured and buried 
can be optimized. Now, uh, coastal vegetated habitats like um, mangroves, salt marshes, uh, seagrass spreads, these are well known as being um, blue carbon habitats because of their extremely powerful ability to sequester and store carbon in their roots and in their soils in which they grow. They are also examples of nature-based solutions to societal challenges, particularly in their function as green infrastructure or natural infrastructure. By protecting coastlines, by uh, buffering wave energy, by managing and protecting runoff from land, um, these are all natural infrastructure um, services that they provide, in addition to their ecological resilience services, such as providing habitats and spawning and nursery areas um, for fish and marine invertebrates. Mangroves are probably the best um, documented and well-established uh, natural uh, infrastructure type. Um, and recent studies have documented that um, mangroves provide 56 billion US dollars worth of coastal protection function annually. If we lost our mangroves, it's estimated that um, an extra 15 million people would be subject to flooding every year. Now, the bad news is that over the last 30 to 50 years, there have been major losses um, often abrupt and irreversible losses in our coastal ecosystems. This includes losses in our coastal vegetated ecosystems. This includes losses of coral reefs. This includes losses of um, oyster reefs. Um, and, our, and our deltas literally are sinking and shrinking because they're being starved of sediment due to sand mining upstream and water diversions upstream. This is creating a perfect storm. We are we are losing we are losing these habitats. We're losing their natural um, ecological and physical resilience functions. We're using losing their natural infrastructure functions, and we are losing their um, ability and potential as carbon sinks. The good news is that um, international finance inst institutions um, thought development thought leaders, ecologists, and engineers all recognize the opportunity of building with nature, of harnessing a green uh, economic recovery. And by harnessing the power of nature, by building with natural systems like forests, mangroves, and seagrass beds, uh, in, we can complement gray infrastructure options um, and we can deliver infrastructure services at reduced costs and with additional co-benefits. COVID-19 economic and uh, economic stimulus packages and, and um, are, are kind of in the order of trillions being put on the table. And one thing we know for sure is that that economic um, stimulus will result in infrastructure uh, projects. In the rush for relief, we, um, we must not lose sight of the opportunity, not just to build back better, but to build with nature as we provide jobs, provide that economic stimulus, as we power the clean energy transformation, and as we, um, as we enhance climate mitigation and as we support the restoration and protection of those natural ecosystems on which we depend. So let's use this wave of economic stimulus, not to further erode the resilience of the coast, but rather to shore up coastal natural uh, infrastructure, to power a green and just economic recovery, and to really harness the absorptive power and capacity of our oceans, in the fight against climate change.
Thank you very much, Chile, for your truly inspiring words. And uh, I know that it's late in Sydney, so thank you for joining us and, uh, and for reaffirming your ambition. And uh, as, as you mentioned, Ocean Solutions Day, they, they must be founded on sound science to best inform policymakers. And, uh, and we need to learn how to best harness the, the power of nature. I think it's a beautiful way of saying it. Um, to best deliver on our ambition for mitigation and adaptation while safeguarding the many resources in the ocean. So thank you so, so much. Um, moving on to the next part, uh, as you know, the ocean was in the spotlight last year during COP25 in Madrid, the, the so-called blue COP under the Chilean presidency. And uh, the ocean is now, is now rising, not just literally, but also on the international climate agenda. And that's be best news. Over the last five years, we have made some significant progress in recognizing the role of the ocean in the climate system. First and foremost, and we heard about it this morning from Hans Otto Portner, and the IPCC special report on ocean the Chrysler was published last year and it addressed for the very first time the crucial role played by marine ecosystems in the overall climate system. And as Vladimir Rayabinin said as well this morning, yeah, this was a game changer for the ocean. And at the end of COP25 last year, we also had other good news is that the ocean made a grand entrance in the final decision of the COP for the first time, where um, it was requested to the chair of SEPSTA, SEPSTA for non-UNFCCC or policy nerds like me, the SEPSTA is the subsidiary body on science and technological advice. So the SEPSTA was asked to convene an ocean and climate dialogue to consider how to strengthen adaptation and mitigation action under the climate convention. So this is a true milestone for the ocean and climate community. This dialogue will be held uh, on 2 and 3 December this year online, obviously. So now we know that the time to raise our ambition is now. And of course, the ocean is an integral part of taking action forward. In that regard, countries, they obviously have a key role to play in ensuring a, a way forward to appropriately address the ocean and climate nexus under the climate negotiations. But Something that we cannot forget is that the race to zero, the race to carbon neutrality is of great concern to all of us, to all actors of civil society. So now let's dive into the next part of our session. Uh, we have an outstanding panel who will be presenting and discussing the innovative work of their respective organizations and truly in inspire us to boost ocean solutions. So I believe that you can see online a, a few speakers have joined us. So welcome, welcome to all. We have Maria Claudia Jazz Granados with Conservation International. We have Chip Cunliffe with AXA XL. And we have Dr. Flower Mzuya with the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative. Um, thank you so much for being here. So we will try to have an interactive dialogue that will be followed by questions. But if I can, if that's okay with all of you, I will, I will start first with Maria Claudia. Maria, you, you are the Blue Carbon Director at Conservation International, and as such, you, you work on the preservation and restoration of coastal blue carbon ecosystems. Uh, Gilly mentioned it as well, the, the role of mangroves and salt marshes as sequestering and storing blue carbon. Um, of course, they play a crucial role in mitigating the effects of climate change. I have the privilege of working closely with Conservation International, so I know how busy you are, and I know that with uh, IUCN and IUC UNESCO, you've actually launched a International Blue Carbon Initiative, which has several very concrete projects on the ground all over the world. And in your case, I believe that you work specifically with the teams in, the, in Latin America and you're based in Bogota. So thank you for being here as well at, at ours. And Maria Claudia, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, why blue carbon is so important, the role of the Blue Carbon Initiative and what is your, your, your take from the, from the field? Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this beautiful and very interesting panel. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you all. And as you mentioned, um, Conservation International with the IUCN and, and IOC UNESCO launched an international blue carbon initiative almost 10 years ago, or perhaps a little bit more than that, as a global program that works to mitigate climate change through restoration and sustainable use of coastal and marine ecosystems, as Julie mentioned already. The Blue Carbon Initiative bring together governments, uh, research institute, non-governmental organization and communities from the world and all, toge all together works to develop management approaches, financial incentives and policy mechanism uh, for ensuring conservation, restoration and obviously sustainable use of coastal blue carbon ecosystems. Um, 
It also engaged local, national, and international governments in order to promote policies uh, that support coastal blue carbon conservation and management, um, and obviously financing because it's, uh, money is needed to do all these uh, interesting projects. It also supports scientific research into uh, the role of coastal blue carbon ecosystem for climate mitigation and develop methods for assessing blue carbon stock and emissions. And all around the world, um, the Blue Carbon Initiative implement project, projects that demonstrate the feasibility of blue carbon accounting management and incentive agreements. And obviously this is very important for all of us in order to conserve and restore these important ecosystems that are key uh, for fighting climate change and um, risk. There are two, two, two groups that are operating and working right now within the Blue Carbon Initiative. One is the scientific group that provides uh, the foundation, the scientific foundation for the Blue Carbon Initiative by synthesizing current and emerging science on blue carbon and provide robust scientific basics for coastal conservation management and assessments. Uh, the group has um, developed a coastal blue carbon method for assessing carbon stock and emissions. It's a manual that you can all find on the website. It's very interesting and, and many countries are using that manual to evaluate and assess blue carbon stocks in the field. The other group, for, uh, it's um, focused on policies and provide framework for policy development that mean maximizes conservation of carbon in coastal ecosystem and mobilizes the implementation of that field framework, builds an integrated blue carbon community that support policy implementation as well. Uh, one recent uh, manual that it, it is also available in the website is the guideline for countries about including blue carbon into NDCs uh, which is really interesting and it's been um, a key for many countries in order to uh, develop the recent document they have to present right now um, uh, for to complete the Paris Agreement as well. But you ask me why blue carbon is so important and I, I think that uh, Dr. Gilly already mentioned a little bit about that. Um, a blue carbon ecosystem provide numerous benefits and services that are essential for communities and biodiversity along coastal along all coast. It is estimated that uh, over 200 million people worldwide live within 10 kilometers of the oceans and mangrove forest. And these people and the communities to which they belong depend on mangroves for food, jobs, cultural identity, and obviously protection from the impact of natural disasters and climate change. Uh, also research um, has shown that these ecosystems also play a key role in climate mitigation, mitigation strategies, as I already mentioned, at local and global scale. So protecting and conserving these ecosystems are, is essential to prevent the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That is one of the key um, services that these uh, ecosystems provide, reducing the acceleration of climate change and its impact but also it supports, they support water, water quality, healthy fisheries that are related with food securities and coastal protection against uh, floods and storm, et cetera. Um, despite all these benefits, as Dr. Gilles also mentioned already, blue carbon ecosystems are some of the most, most threatened ecosystems on earth. Uh, it's estimated that we have lost more than 60% of the mangrove worldwide. Uh, we also have lost almost 35% 30 of tidal marshes and almost 30% of seagrasses, needles everywhere. Uh, and that is why initiatives such as the Blue Carbon Initiative and the IPBC, which is the International Blue Carbon Partnership, just a government or a, a alliance and the Global Mangrove Alliance as well are essential to meet globally these um, conservation and restoration goals and to work all together towards achieving that goals, which is uh, our role here in, in the world. 
Thank you so much, Claudia, for your very, Maria Claudia, sorry, for your very clear explanation and, and stressing the importance of these critical ecosystems. As you mentioned, we need to push for the science to policy approach in all our endeavors. So thank you for paving the way uh, in, that, in that sense. And, uh, and of course, blue carbon in NDCs is a true achievement of that effort. So thank you so much. So now I will turn to our next panelist, who is also working towards building resilience and mitigating the impacts of climate change on the ground. Dr. Flower Mzuya, thank you for joining us today. Um, you are the founder and chairperson of the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative. And for over 20 years, you have been promoting seaweed farming in Tanzania by studying climate change and modifying farming methods. So that sounds very, very fascinating. So could you please, Flower, tell us a bit more about your, uh, your initiative and how the development of farming technologies actually boosts resilience. Thank you very much. Um, in, in my country, we farm two types of seaweed. One is higher valued seaweed and its price is double that of the other one. So we have that in mind when we are speaking. Uh, I started the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative in 2006 initiative that works to link farmers to, to government, to research and other stakeholders. And they have been doing that for over uh, 10 years. And uh, we, within the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative, I've been developing technologies for farming seaweed as well, and then for adding value. And this I've worked for it for over 10 years now. So farming, within farming, we're talking about farming seaweed in, in, in the deeper waters compared to shallow water, areas where it is farmed now. In the deep, deeper water areas, conditions are more stable, they are more optimal. And then, so I started to develop uh, technologies, uh, a number of them, maybe four or five of them, but I, th they were not as optimal. Now I have, uh, now the latest is the tubular net uh, technology, which I started researching in uh, 2014. Now, but why, why, why would I develop technologies for, for farming and value addition? Well, it is because the, of the increase in the surface sea water temperature. Uh, water temperatures, especially in the shallow water areas where seaweeds are farmed is increasing over the years. Obviously, we have the impact of climate change. And therefore we see that the farmers cannot farm the higher value seaweed to get the double the price, the seaweed that is susceptible to high temperatures. And we have seen recently also that in the hot season, even the lower value seaweed, which is hardy, is also being affected. So what's the, the result of this? It means that some of the farmers have stopped farming and some are farming seasonally. So by, by developing the, the, the farming technologies in deeper, in deeper waters, it means that the farmers can get a higher value seaweed, so they can farm the higher value seaweed, so they get a, a, quality, a, a product of high quality and they get high prices out of, the, out of the, the higher quality product. And then also in the deep waters, there is high production because higher production because they work, they, the seaweed grows faster and the biomass is, 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 is higher. So, and in, when we are training about the deep water farming methods and other technologies, we are actually training the women to work with men and the men to work with the women. And mind you, this is not the case in the shallow water areas because in the shallow water areas, everyone has his or her own farms, but working together in the deep waters, that's something we, we train them. The, the technology of adding value to the lower valued seaweed uh, means that the, the, the farmers can produce, can make seaweed products and they sell at higher prices. For example, a jar of seaweed jam is a, is a, is sells at a dollar, a bar of soap is a dollar, a kilo of seaweed powder for $4, compared with only uh, 25 cents of a dollar for raw and processed seaweed. So uh, if they, they are working on this, we, we have farmers who can have higher quality product, they can get high prices, they can get higher production, and they work together in families or groups to help each other it mean, and they can make products and, and sell at higher prices it means that these people will continue to work in the seaweed industry they will not quit so despite the impact of climate change that is hitting them all, all the time these people will keep on working in the, in the seaweed industry because of the technologies that we developed in they become very resilient and they continue with their their activities thank you Thank you so much, Flower. This is truly, truly inspiring to, 
to show this concrete example of how you not, not only build resilience, but also provide opportunities and vital services for local communities, such as job growth and food. And we will definitely get back to that in a little while. But uh, we've, we have heard it a lot since the beginning of this session, but money, money is important and we need to get the money flowing. So obviously another fundamental aspect of scaling up action is to incentivize investments into nature-based solutions and ensure the mobilization of the finance and private sectors in that regard. So now let me turn to our third speaker, Chip Cunliffe. It's great to see you again, Chip. Um, you are the Director for Sustainable Development at AXA XL. Among others, you two are very busy, but um, you are responsible for AXA's Ocean Risk Initiative which aims at catalyzing product innovation and a broader insurance industry response to ocean risk. In particular, AXA has launched the Ocean Risk and Resilience Alliance, Aura, which is a multi-sectoral collaboration from the Global South designed to drive $500 million into groundbreaking finance products by 2030. So that's pretty ambitious, well done. Uh, Chip, can you tell us a bit more about your work, how Aura is, is designed to, to address the barriers to investing in nature-based solutions for Crystal protection. Thank you, Chip. Thanks, Lorelai. Yeah, look, uh, thank you very much for having me as well, and uh, and great to to be a part of this panel. I think it's uh, uh, lots of lots of crossovers with uh, what our fellow um, panelists have, have already said. So, look, I, I mean, I, we know that nature-based solutions are a, a critical part of um, disaster risk reduction and climate climate adaptation. Um, I know that. Uh, uh, Julie sort of talked about the you know the, the cost effectiveness of them, the fact that they have those that significant environmental, social, and economic economic benefits. Um, I think that um, you know what we do need to, however, do is to recognise how ecosystems are accounted for. And I know that you know Marie Claudia um, talked about that as well. Um, so you know what are they worth? You know we need to put a dollar value on them because ultimately we still know that they're often overlooked or underappreciated in policy decisions uh, within the investments uh, side and also risk management frameworks. So this, the side that I come from in, in risk and investment is, is critical. Um, I, I suppose we need to, we all know that we need to drive investment into this space. Um, I was listening to the Paris Peace Forum this morning and they were just saying that, you know, uh, 140 to 350 billion dollars a year needs to be drive, driven into adaptation by 2030 and you know i think nature-based solutions is very much a part of that but we also know that there are various barriers um to to to, to putting that money in that space and and i think part of that is about the nature investments uh, nature of the investments that you know require that productive return um we also know that there's a, a very short pipeline of pro investable projects um, that investors could actually uh, put put sort of money into and of course it's not just that we're not just looking at you know you know one or two million dollars here and there we're looking at the need to drive hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into the space um, I, one of the one of the other barriers i think is probably that the fact that there's a lack of data um, to quantify the risks to the investments themselves um, and so, you know, Aura is, is very much about looking to do that. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. Um, but the other two barriers are about, about sort of creating that enabling policy environment. Um, and finally, is really about um, developing the timescale or ensuring that the timescale required for that return on investment um, is, uh, is good for the investor themselves. So Aura has basically was, was, was launched in 2019 at the UN to, as you say, to drive $500 million into, into coastal natural capital by 2030. It's, a, it's very much a multi-sectoral approach. So it's not just the insurance and, and wider finance industry, it's working alongside governments, uh, the NGO sector, uh, and, and of course, all based on science. So some of the examples that we are working on at the moment is how we're able to enable uh, the deployment of coral reef insurance, um, so, you know, we have one example currently in, in Mexico, but of course we need to scale all these different things. Um, you know, how we're able to integrate healthy ecosystems into risk models. So some work that we're doing on, a, on developing a coastal risk index. Uh, we're working on micro insurance for small scale fishes in the Philippines. Uh, really, I suppose, in that space, in that, in that sense, um, ensuring that, you know, that there is a sustainable um, uh, fishing uh, fleet uh, of small-scale fishes in, in the Philippines themselves. Um, we're also looking at um, 
illegal, uh, unregulated, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, yeah, I IOU fishing, um, and really driving a proactive approach to minimising the insurance industry's uh, link to that. And of course, you know, there's stuff about mangrove insurance as well. So there's there's lots of things going on, but it's really about how we identify um, those projects and products that we can we can scale um, very quickly. Thank you very much, Chip. It's really wonderful to see the growing commitment of the private sector. And uh, here, I believe we're really uh, we're at the heart of what the Race to Zero campaign is trying to achieve: to mobilize everyone from a multi a lateral approach, but also collectively, it's it's truly interesting. And of course, I couldn't agree more that we need to really stress the importance of investing into adaptation solutions. Now it's it's critical. As we've mentioned, public-private collaborations, they're blooming all over the place and uh, everyone is very much dedicated to implementing nature-based solutions, better protecting and sustainably managing uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, there are some great alliances that are forming to do this. So I will actually turn back to, to Maria Claudia for this because uh, so I've heard that Apple has actually partnered with Conservation International to help you develop a, a new approach to valuing the full carbon potential of of blue carbon ecosystems. So could you could you please explain us how this model works and how we can be scaled up? As Chip was saying, this is this is the key here. We need to scale up action. So how do we do this? Please, Maria Claudia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again. And and yes, it it has been a very interesting alliance. We have CI with Apple uh, that helped us um, move forward with a very nice project, uh, CI Colombia Develop together with, uh, in partnership, basically, with the national authorities and National Marine and Research Institute, a, national, a couple of national NGOs and local communities. And the project is based or is focused on mangrove conservation and restoration. It's called Vida Manglar. In Spanish, means life mangroves. So everyone is looking um, to conserve these mangrove forests using and pioneer new methodologies to measure greenhouse gas emissions uh, from these forests. And, and Apple um, got in love of, the, of, that, of that project, I, I have to say, um, because there are all approximately 12,000 inhabitants living in and around those mangroves. And, and, and those communities um, live in extreme poverty. Uh, and they make, as, as Flower was also mentioning, they use directly natural resources from within the mangroves. It, 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 that forest is also home to five species of uh, mangroves that provide habitat to critically endangered fauna, uh, such as manatees, otters, caiman needle crocodiles, turtles, that are not only important for touristic activities, but also are key for local communities um, well-being as well. So um, the project fully account for the carbon uh, value in this ecosystem, not just in the trees, but also in the soil, which is one of the innovations that we are doing, at least in Colombia, and maximize the financial remuneration available to conserve these areas. This obviously requires a national and side scale feasibility assessment, good data, as you, as Chip was saying, we need to have data and we need to value that information as well. Um, it also includes stakeholder engagement, baseline development, and of, obviously a project um, development and implementation that includes um, activities in the field to conserve and restore these uh, mangroves and also um, uh, to, to promote um, sustainable development around the forest. And, and everything, uh, an apple came to this project uh, to generate, to try to generate uh, revenues from blue carbon boutique credits. We sell boutique because it's a very small project with a lot of information, with a very good partnership um, included. And, and the idea is selling those credits to provide long-term financial sustainability for all these activities. So the project right now, and thanks to the um, to Apple investment, is applying to for blue carbon credit so through verified carbon carbon standard by Vera BCS, and an additional certification under climate community and biodiversity. 
We are right now ready to expand this first phase of the project. The project is a multiple scale in a place called Golfo de Morrosquillo in the Colombian Caribbean. And, and we are ready to expand that project. Um, and, our, and another um, benefit uh, from that project is the improvement of local communities and new livelihood, livelihood opportunities and, and options that are expected to increase health and wealth of those living in and around the project. Uh, I, I have to say that um, conserving and restoring these carbon ecosystems, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a no regret solution, but we have to be very innovative in order to find financial sustainability to do so. Um, selling blue carbon credit is one option. I, I have to say it's not the best one, it's not the unique, but it's one way of guaranteeing long-term uh, investment for those projects and provide an op a unique opportunity to address, obviously, carbon emissions. And, and as we were mentioned before, uh, that helps um, mitigating the impacts of climate change, but also it helps adapting people or, or, or trying, trying to create more resilient communities uh, for these um, changes that we are living right now in the world. So um, this project, I have to say, it's the first carbon pro blue carbon project that uses that methodology and that will unlock the mechanism for carbon crediting or blue carbon crediting, which are globally scalable and can, be, uh, can, can, can cause a significant transformation in ocean and coastal protection. If we do that, and if we show that it's effective, efficient, and it's also it's financial um, sustainable. Thank you very much, Maria Claudia, for this very detailed and rich answer. I'm sure that we will have a lot of questions going forward. And as a reminder, if you want to ask your questions, you can go on the Slido website and enter the hashtag race to zero. Um, and then maybe we'll hear more from Maria Claudia from this. But thank you, because it's it's really clear now that protecting blue carbon ecosystems and the vital services that they provide is detrimental to address climate change and uh, the whole climate crisis. But it's also fundamental for local communities. And you have stressed it in your, in your intervention just now. And, you know, nature-based solutions, they, they hold obviously some great potential to protect marine ecosystems and mitigate climate change. But let's not forget that in many cases, if not in most cases, they also effectively address societal challenges by entering human well-being and providing a number of socioeconomic benefits. And, and here we're, we're not only in the ocean and climate nexus, but ocean and climate, biodiversity, food security, and the whole 2030 agenda for sustainable development, everything is linked and we need to emphasize that. Anyhow, I will turn back to Flower now because I believe that your, your outstanding work on seaweed farming has actually contributed and benefited uh, local communities in Zanzibar. As a very brief uh, mention, the picture right behind me was taken in Zanzibar, so uh, it's a dreamy place. And thank you so much for for all your efforts in in protecting this vital ecosystem. So that's uh, that's great. But now I would like, uh, if you, if you don't mind, Flower, to for you to tell us a bit more about how, in your case, the, the development of uh, innovative farming technologies has impacted uh, local communities and mo most specifically on marginalized women. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the, the 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 technology that we, we developed to farm in the in the deep water areas, we we have uh, two two vill villages where this uh, um, two planets te technology is being uh, used, and uh, in in each case we have about about fifteen women working in each group. They are working with uh, three to four men who help them because the the, the technology needs diving. To anchor the, the the two planets, and the women have to 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 work with the men, so they can help them. But these women actually have managed to to uh, to, to, to 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 cultivate the higher value seaweed, and because of that, they they earn more, and they, and they are also increasing the, the production. Because before we developed the the, the technology. The, the women were not harvesting much actually you know, of this higher valued seaweed. Uh, most of them had uh, just uh, uh, 
decided to farm the lower valued one, but now they can produce this higher valued seaweed. And actually, uh, um, apart from from the higher valued seaweed, also when you, when they when they anchor the, uh, the the nets in the in the in the ocean, they also catch fish. So because fish uh, come to hide under the nets, so they have the 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 seaweed and then they have the the fish so this actually has has improved the the people and they are they are very happy about about using this uh, this technology because they can they can have uh they can plant the higher value seaweed and 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 also we see that actually if you look at the for example the uh, value value adding uh process the, the the women who are doing that actually have uh, they are when you look when they are you talk to them they are different from those who are not doing the deep water farming or adding value to the seaweed selling products they have more money and they do a lot of more things uh like uh, taking care of the families building houses buying motorbikes things like that so for for these technologies actually the women have improved their lives and they are really happy about using these technologies Thank you, thank you very much, Flower. This is really, really inspiring, and uh, we we must not forget that, of course, the impacts of climate change uh, will be worsened for the most vulnerable communities. So your your leadership, your expertise is invaluable in this in this discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, going back to to Chip as well, I believe that Aura's objective is also to focus on protecting the regions and communities that need it the most. So for for this, of course, you you need to build a build a foundation for a new marketplace willing to invest in nature-based solutions and coastal natural capital. It is also my understanding that to achieve this objective, um, the Aura Alliance has launched its Ocean Resilience Innovation Challenge to identify and nurture a pipeline of up to ten finance and insurance innovations. That challenge runs until twenty November, so it's pretty much tomorrow. So can you tell us a bit more about what it means and how we can engage in this uh, challenge. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, look, it's not tomorrow, so that's good. Um, you have another week at least. Um, but yeah, no, the, the, the innovation challenge is really about driving investment into those coastal ecosystems, as I said before. And, and I suppose that the, the key piece is how we're able to, to, to provide that return on investment. So, um, you know, what, one of the criteria is about you know, reducing ocean risk for the most vulnerable. Um, but, you know, all entries really, you know, we want to focus on, you know, the viability of the, uh, of, of the idea, the innovativeness, um, how we can scale uh, the impact and, of course, equity alongside that too. But, you know, as part of Aura uh, and, you know, the work that we're doing, you know, gender and human rights um, are, are key pieces to be aware of. Um, and, of course, we also want to, to look at protecting biodiversity. Uh, as well. So, you know, we're certainly keen to have proposals from either individual organisations, from, uh, con from consortia, uh, from public and or private sector, um, uh, you know, local society, NGOs, academia. I mean, we're keen to, to hear from anybody um, with, with, uh, with some really good and well thought out uh, proposals. Um, the idea is that you know we will um, select winners um, at the end of this calendar year. Um, we will announce them in, in early 21, um, and the, each project will be will received uh, will receive, shall I say, um, support um, to maximise their potential for impact, scalability, and also investability as well. Because of course that is you know a, a key part of this. Um, we will provide a, a tailored mentoring program, and that will be run partly by the Global Resilience Partnership, um, but we will we'll be link, bringing in uh, mentors from the insurance and finance industries uh, and, and others as well. Um, and that is really focused on, you know, communications um, and leadership support as well, really to, to try and ensure that those projects are funding ready uh, when, we, we, when we come out of this, uh, you know, about the middle of next year. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, we are hopefully hoping to, to, to link the, those projects um, to potential investors as well uh, and, and partners from across our network. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of information actually on our website, so Ocean Resilience, uh, sorry, yeah, oceanresilience.org. Um, um, and, um, uh, and the benefits, of course, to the winners are on there. Um, the guidelines for applicants 
uh, are on there as well. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to um, to, to hearing from from those people who might have uh, an idea or or, or two uh, to, uh, to to look at the investment in this space. Wonderful, thank you so much. So, as Chip mentioned, it's not one day but one week. So please go on the on the yes. website and get involved. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. It's been a very, very rich and very fruitful conversation. I have learned a lot, so I hope that the people watching us are also very interested. Um, we have heard some great examples of nature-based solutions and designed to build resilience, to protect ecosystems and the services they provide to people. And uh, of course, we have addressed ocean risk and how to scale up these solutions. So it's been very stimulating. So now let's, uh, let's give a chance to, to the great public listening to us um, to ask their questions to our distinguished panelists. We have received a few comments. First of all, I want to say that most comments say, thank you very much, it's been very inspiring, it's been great. So congratulations to all of our speakers and thank you again for, for being here. Um, to, to respect the timing that we have today, I won't be able to ask all the questions, but um, I, will, I will start with a, with a few. So first of all, how realistic is it to try to develop carbon credits for small scale seaweed farming such as that happening in Zanzibar and what is needed to make it feasible. So maybe Maria Claudia, you can take the first uh, question. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it's good. Um, it's feasible, of course. I, you need to look at the project itself and, and see what is uh, the project like. I never work with seaweeds in the past, so I, I'm not sure how the project should be framed or developed, but I think uh, having the uh, example from mangroves in other places, I think um, it's really uh, interesting to try to apply these kind of processes in order to get um, financial sustainability, knowing that in some cases is not the best strategy, um, in other is not the only one. But if you have a, a small project and you can combine different financial um, strategies that could be very interesting. Um, but I think that perhaps Flo perhaps Flower have something else to say because she's the one that leads all, leads all these seaweed processes. Yes, Flower, so I, do you have some comments to add? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, in my case, I think that a seaweed farm can really be used to, to can be used for, for this purpose. We see, we have heard how, how seaweeds uh, are able to sink the, the carbon so much. And it just needs the, it needs the intervention of the government. The government can make programs, can, uh, can help come out with, with programs that will be uh, used by private people or by just citizens or seaweed farmers to, to ask for this, this um, uh, carbon uh, system. So I think that the, if you look at uh, governments, our governments, most of them have not started doing this, but it is very potential. And I think that the government, governments should be part of, of this and it is quite possible to have this, uh, this system. Thank you very much. Chip, do you want to add something or maybe we move on to the next question? Yeah, well, only sort of, um, I mean, not necessarily about seaweed, but just in the blue carbon piece. I mean, I know that um, CI is very much a leader in this space. Um, we're also working with the Nature Conservancy on, a, on, on something similar, which, which looks at sort of blue carbons from mangroves, but also um, developing a resilience credit as well. So um, utilising the, the, the protective benefits of mangroves um, to uh, and, and providing a... Uh, or, or giving the protective benefits of those mangroves um, a, a, a value as well, um, and so you know I think there's some some really interesting pieces of work going on in this in this in the sort of blue carbon space. Um, I think it's it's very much a nascent area of work, um, but uh, you know some, somewhere I think that uh, as, um, as has been mentioned, you know I think that uh, that, that can scale, um, and it probably needs to scale pretty rapidly. Um, I, I think we, we need to scale it rapidly, but I think we need to do it in the right way. I mean, that's that's critical, of course. Great, thank you very much. And um, I like that next, next question because it touches upon the, the UNFCCC processes. So uh, 
um, is actually asked to all the speakers. And how do we translate some of the things that you have mentioned into concrete ocean specific commitments into the NDCs? So to give maybe a little bit of background for again, non-policy nerds, uh, the NDCs are the nationally determined contributions. So they are the cornerstone of the Paris Agreement. The commitments that each country has to make to uh, achieve the ambitions of the Paris Agreement and uh, in terms of mitigation, because uh, the mitigation um, objectives will be quantified uh, and will be evaluated every five years. So now we're reaching to a new cycle from 2015 and many countries have, um, uh, have committed to including the ocean or ocean related measures into their NDCs. Um, in that respect, if, uh, if since that question came up, uh, I would encourage everyone to go to the ocean uh, because the ocean initiative website they published last year an excellent report on the the different ocean measures that can be included into ndc's for mitigation as well as for adaptation and for hybrid solutions so yeah so maybe um and of course ocean solutions in ndc's is one of the critical ways that we can push the ocean climate nexus so um who wants to take the the the, the lead for that question Maria Claudia, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to throw you under the bus here as well, because you mentioned the NDCs in the in the discussion before. And of course, Blue Carbon is one of the only ecosystems that's truly recognized. So I, I did. I did. I did mention that because uh, as part of what we are doing within CI is trying to in, in, um, promote the integration or the inclusion of Blue Carbon ecosystems into NDCs in each of the countries. And, and, and I have to say that sometimes it's not that easy, as you may um, understand or know that some countries, um, they don't have specific data or very good data related of, on mangroves. And, and of, of course, there is little about seagrasses or salt marshes. So it's very difficult to uh, commit as, as a political level to do something related with those ecosystems. Nevertheless, we think that it is very important at least to have the will to do something uh, towards uh, conserving and restoring those ecosystems because they are acting and they are having a very important role on mitigation and adaptations activities related of course with climate change um, impacts. And that is why um, I strongly recommend um, if you want to read that manual, that guidelines on how to include blue carbon ecosystems into indices because it's a very, very um, easy and comprehensive document that helps government to include in different stages. We don't have, we don't need to, govern it, governments don't need to have a very strong data sets in order to do so. They can also add the uh, um, concept there and then open the space to work towards um, gathering more information in the future, but, but it's also a political will or political commitment to do something uh, which is so important to conserve, to um, fight against climate change. So I, I, I strongly believe that it's, um, it's key right now for um, governments from different countries uh, to commit, including blue carbon ecosystems into their uh, national commitments, national goals uh, to fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Claudia, uh, for this very helpful answer. And of course, if uh, the people watching us are interested in um, further discussing how to include ocean related measures into NDCs, I strongly invite you to follow the next session on innovation, because it will address also renewable energies and, and shipping, which are key elements to be included in, uh, in the NDCs. I'm going to take one last question from the floor and then we're going to have to move on, unfortunately. Um, so nature based solutions were defined by different players. UNEP, IUCN, companies, etc. Uh, but depending on their interests. So the question is whether we should be careful about the misuse of nature-based solutions as a concept. Maybe Flower, do you wanna do you wanna jump in here? Um, yes, I agree. I, I it is it is true true. We have to be careful because sometimes we know that. Uh, nature-based solutions that it depends really on nature we have to conserve the nature because if we don't conserve the nature 
it means that uh, even the solutions that we are we are asking we are uh, hoping to use or we are using will not work if the nature is is, is 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 destroyed so we need to be careful we need to conserve the nature we need to be careful about using 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 the nature and use the natural resources use the nature in a sustainable way making sure that it is continuous that we will not uh, um, destroy and then we, we destroy even our own solutions because they will not work anymore yeah wonderful thank you maybe chip do you want to say a final word to to close this q a session yeah well i was just going to say a final word that, that sort of links to maybe the the penultimate question which is um you know how do we uh, employ this for the greater good and benefit of indigenous communities and i think that that's uh, you know it's absolutely critical that you know when we're working on this in this space that we do so um at the local level um and so of course you know partly by uh, working with um you know across you know the public private partnership where you know you, you are able to work with you know the finance sector but also working with ngos like ci um, on the ground um, and you know who know the the local um, uh, the, the local environment uh, and the people who are likely to be benefiting from this and of course it needs to be of benefit to those to those individuals and it needs to go down to that individual level so I think it's a, a really critical piece and I you know I, I do think nature-based solutions is a is a uh, is, it is right that we are focusing on that and, and looking at that as, as potential solutions in terms of mitigation and adapt adaptation um but we need to do that at the local level wonderful thank you so much thank you to our three wonderful speakers for for committing um to this session for sharing your expertise your knowledge and your ambition and thank you so much so big uh, round of virtual applause for for you all unfortunately we have to move on to the next part of our of our session i would have enjoyed further discussing with you but um i'm sure that our great public is a uh, very much enjoyed this and thank you for all your questions and now we have to move on to the next part of this session which will be very interactive as well and uh, and very exciting so i can now welcome uh, four new speakers who have joined on screen i hope so um hello everybody um thank you for being being here with us today of course and the objective of this next part is to to showcase some some concrete leadership through action so we have four incredible speakers who will have each a few minutes to, to take us on a deep dive of their inspiring work and, and showcase what innovation looks like. So let's not waste any time because that sounds very interesting. And uh, let's bring on our first ocean leader, Monsieur Romain Troublé. Uh, Romain, you are the CEO of the Tara Ocean Foundation. You are also the president of the Ocean and Climate Platform. So I have the privilege of working with you on a regular basis. Um, and I believe that you are actually talking to us live from the Tara vessel, making us very jealous that you're at sea and that we're stuck at home. So thank you so much for taking the time, for being here. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of the groundbreaking work that the Tara Ocean Foundation is, is doing, especially on the biological carbon pump. So please, Romain, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Very nice uh, panels and very nice discussion so far. And uh, very so. So I learned a lot today, so I'm very happy to be on, to be on board today. So we are, it's indeed, I speak to you from the Traverser. We are off the coast of France to preparing one of the next uh, two-year projects we are launching in the one month from now, straight. I mean, maybe I will share some uh, my screen with some, uh, some images, not, not slides, but images. If you can see my screen now. You see my screen? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm managing the Tara Ocean Foundation, and we are on this boat now. As I speak now, uh, and we, we said it's really like a, a public-private partnership we are at to with this project, uh, with these actions. Uh, it's uh, public science from all over the world involved in the project we met, we run, and uh, it's funded by private partners, private donors, people, you and me, to make sure that this boat keeps sailing and keep doing research on the ocean. So we are really well up with, upstream of, uh, of the talks that we have before on the land, on the coast. We really care about the, the, the global environment, whether it is in the Arctic, in, on the coral reef around the world, or, or at sea all over the place, in, most of the time in the high seas, but also on the coastal areas, which I've talked about a lot with the blue carbon economy. Um, 
I mean, uh, recently we, I mean, 50, 20 years ago, we realized that to cut the clarify the carbon uh, capture from the planet was both as important on land and on the ocean. You can see here all the green areas in the ocean that really shows these these primary productions and also the the huge amount of carbon that is captured from the atmosphere to the to the ocean and then to the bottom of the ocean in sediments. And if you look carefully about this closer to France where we are now with tides, you really see this kind of blooming stuff from primary produc productive ocean producing a lot of, of, of carbon matter or pr pr primary uh, production, but also storing a lot of CO2 and, and, and making a lot, of, a lot of oxygen. All these ecosystem services we talked about a bit today. Uh, so we start, we are in an endeavor to discover this world, to discover this more smaller microalgae you can see here. Coccolito force that when you really deep forward, you look at where we find them and we really find them like the in Dover, the, the cliffs of Dover, they're really made of 100% nearly this uh, limestone has been done by this kind of uh, algae, sedimenting from the atmosphere, from CO2 in the atmosphere going down into the, the bottom of the ocean. So how this is working, how this carbon pump is using these microbiomes, these crazy microscopic organisms that work together in the ocean, viruses, bacteria, uh, microcellular, unicellular algae, seaweed if you want, but very small ones. So they are making a lot of, uh, of such uh, carbon, uh, carbon capturation in the ocean globally. Uh, and of course, as they, carbon, they capture CO2, they also produce oxygen a lot. And every time half of the oxygen we have on the planet has been produced by this kind of ecosystems. So what are they? How are they working? How this microscopic world is, is behaving in the ocean, where you will look in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, how we can understand all this uh, microscopic life, uh, its sensibility to climate change, to pollution. Uh, will these ecosystem services will be will remain or will be enhanced or diminished in the future? In which area? How can we understand better the ocean as a dynamic, in fact, uh, place? Um, how can we understand the carbon pump uh, of this ocean? So we start, we, we, since 10 years now, we, we, we crisscross the planet uh, to sample something like 100,000 samples uh, of these microscopic organisms. And we measure the carbon pump, the, 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 the sinking, the drawdown of carbon every day. We cross, we, we, sail, we sail in the ocean. The drawdown of carbon we can see on the planet. And, uh, and you can really see differences and so we you can really see different patterns and of course the, the tides the streams the currents are having a lot of of, of impact but uh, so this leads us to a way to think that uh, in the future we may not want to protect the ocean because there is a border but because there is a an oceanographic stream currents that are key to the rest of the ecosystem that we need really need to protect in these areas to make mpas in these areas because they have a huge impact on the on the rest of the food chain, on the rest of the ecosystem that are storing CO2 or the, or elsewhere in the ocean. So we try to understand how this is working. We use genomics, all the last technologies we have in the hand today to, to study the, the planet and to study the ecology of it, to really understand the biology of what's living in the ocean, because this is really the key partner, the key player in this carbon food, uh, carbon uh, drawdown of, uh, from the atmosphere to the bottom of the ocean. And really the, the idea is to understand how in the future we can say, okay, this is our area, area, key area, shock points in the ocean that we need, really need to care about and to protect all year long or maybe six year, six months per year, because this is a key processes that are happening there and are very important for the huge carbon sink uh, processes we can find uh, in the ocean as well. So yeah, back to the forest, but uh, for the forest of the ocean. Thank you very much for your attention. I think it's all I wanted to say today. Thank you so much, Roman. What, a, what wonderful images, what wonderful leadership. Um, you're definitely leading a true scientific revolution for our ocean, our climate, and well, basically humanity as a whole. So what a great kickstart to our lighting round of speakers. So thank you very much, Roman. And bye-bye from the, from the, from the sea. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. So Have now let me, thank you, Roman. Let me turn to uh, Dr. Jennifer Smith from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Jennifer, uh, I believe it's extremely early for you now, so thank you for your commitment as well. Um, your lab actually focuses on understanding how humans actually impact marine ecosystems in different environments. You must be extremely busy. Um, so please, Jennifer, tell us more about how 
you're developing strategies to protect these critical ecosystems for, for the future generations. So Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for the, the opportunity to, to speak today and share some of the exciting new solutions that are coming out of the ocean to help fight climate change. Um, as you mentioned, my for my the majority of my scientific career, I've spent my life essentially studying how humans impact marine ecosystems around the world, whether it be in temperate or tropical ecosystems. And I can tell you that the one thing that they all share in common is that they're all being incredibly heavily impacted by climate change, um, whether it be sea level warming, whether it be sea level rise, whether it be ocean acidification. And we know that all of these impacts are being caused by the increase in greenhouse gas emissions that are happening around the planet. And while we all know about carbon dioxide being you know, the most abundant greenhouse gas, um, there are other greenhouse gases that have potentially a greater potential to, to help rapidly reverse some climate change impacts. And so methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And methane actually is about 30 times more potent in terms of its warming potential than CO2. And one of the really um, exciting things about thinking about managing methane is that it has a much shorter lifespan in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So methane is in the atmosphere for you know, 10 to 12 years, as opposed to hundreds to thousands of years with carbon dioxide. And so this means if we can find solutions for managing methane, now we can actually will actually see these realized changes in our lifetime in a decade or, or two. And so when we think about what are the main sources of methane emissions in the atmosphere, um, the largest source of anthropogenic methane is actually the livestock industry. And so um, specifically uh, livestock, including cattle, sheep and goats. These are the, the ruminant animals, the animals that um, have enteric fermentation and in the process of their digestion, they actually produce methane as a waste product. And that methane, the majority of that methane that is produced is essentially burped out of their mouth and goes straight into the atmosphere. Um, and so this industry has received a lot of criticism from environmentalists, notably because of the, the massive impact to greenhouse gas emissions. And there really hasn't been a viable solution for this industry to apply to essentially reduce, mitigate, or even manage, manage methane at any relevant um, scalable uh, solution. And so this fact we can fast forward to essentially 2016, where some researchers in Australia um, were experimenting with different types of applications to the, the gut microbiota, the bacteria that live in ruminant um, stomachs, to try to see how we might be able to manage or, or affect the, their methane production. And they were focused on a lot of different species of seaweed. Um, again, another uh, interesting thing about seaweed is that they produce a lot of very interesting chemical compounds, which have a whole variety of different applications from drug discovery for human use to antibiotics, um, a whole bunch of other things. But what they found was that one particular species, um, this red seaweed pictured at the bottom of this slide, Asparagopsis um, taxiformis, when fed in very small quantities or exposed to uh, the gut microbiota in very small quantities actually could nearly eliminate methane production. And while these early studies were done in petri dishes, looking at you know, the gut microbiomes isolated from the animals, over the last couple of years, a whole variety of additional studies have taken place um, across the world where uh, scientists have actually been able to feed livestock um, ground up asparagopsis and these studies have shown consistent and very strong results leading to up to 90 percent reduction reduction in methane emissions in these livestock animals um, so why am i as a marine biologist talking to you about methane management in livestock um, that leads us to why isn't this application being broadly used around the planet today um, and that is because the seaweed is actually very finicky. We have, we've never grown it commercially. We have no uh, blueprint for how to cultivate it. You know, we, we don't just develop a massive commercial scale operation overnight. And so that's where myself and a, a whole bunch of other scientists around the world are working to try to identify how to make this a scalable solution. 
Um, you can imagine if we were able to reduce methane emissions by 90% for the one and a half billion cattle, let alone similar number of sheep and goats around the planet, we could have a real impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And so there are many challenges associated with this. This is a, a new, you know, fairly new solution, but it's one where we think um, once we can nail down the, the strategies for growing this, both land-based cultivation as well as in open ocean cultivation settings, this will create new blue economy jobs around the planet that can be scaled to communities all over, both in um, small rural, rural areas as well as in uh, big, heavily populated parts of the planet. And so we're really excited about this solution. And you know, while this is just one example of a novel solution where um, the ocean can provide potentially uh, highly impactful greenhouse gas mitigating um, opportunities, there are, I'm sure, many others. And I would just encourage all the young scientists and entrepreneurs out there to continue searching in the ocean for solutions like this. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This is fascinating and reminding us that what happens uh, on land obviously has an impact at sea. So we need to address the interface between between the planet, the terrestrial land and the, and the ocean, of course. Thank you so much. We will definitely be looking at this innovative solution very closely in the future. So thank you. Um, moving away from the scientific perspective now, let's go, let's go back on the ground. This time we're going to Kenya with our next speaker, uh, Gabriela Coco. Caribou, Gabriel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. You work at uh, Mikoko Pamoja or mangroves together in Swahili. You, you lead a, a community-led mangrove conservation and restoration project. So come here to, to, to know more, please. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'm going to present and give insights on Mikoko Pamoja. That is a community-based uh, mangrove carbon offset scheme uh, in Kenya. Okay, Mikoko Pamoja means mangroves together. So uh, as it has been said, for this, the community believe that when conserving mangroves as an ecosystem, then their functionality is increased. And at the same time, uh, when they work together, for example, in activities such as uh, conservation, uh, planting, and other restoration activities, then they can achieve a lot that will enhance uh, ecosystem functionality as well as uh, community livelihood improvement. So as they carry out their activities, it's also uh, a chant, like they can chant Mikoko Pamoja, Mikoko Pamoja. So it gives them that spirit uh, to be able to carry on with the activities. So Mikoko Pamoja uh, carbon offset scheme was established in 2013. And then it's, it's established in the south coastal part of Kenya. And then uh, it its objective is to restore and protect carbon through sale of uh, mangrove credits. And it is uh, verified by Plan Vivo for the next 20 years to be able to sell uh, the mangrove credits. So uh, it's conserving mangroves in 117 acreage in which uh, there is avoided def deforestation area of about 107 hectares, and then plantation of 10 hectares and an area of 0 0.5 hectares that is planted on an annual basis. So uh, in the project uh, as a, a carbon offset scheme, it's able to ensure uh, permanence by uh, setting that side which is not cut. So it's ensuring that a mangrove, uh, like carbon that is produced is captured and stored in the mangrove sinks. And then it's also uh, ensuring reduction of uh, carbon leakage by one, providing alternative uh, forest that is for, with the first growing species such as Kashuarina, for which communities can cut from and therefore they reduce our uh, pressure on the mangroves. Another aspect of uh, carbon leakage reduction is by giving uh, community members that is in Gazi and Makongeni villages in South Coastal Kenya, uh, efficient wood fuel stoves. So when they're given this, uh, for one, there is a reduction of pressure because uh, they use limited amount of wood fuel. At the same time, there is a re reduced emissions and therefore it's also uh, enhancing on the health of the community members. So, uh, and then uh, it's enhancing additionality by ensuring that plantation activities is done so that whatever is there they're also doing plantation to ensure that there's additional uh, offsetting of, of, of carbon. So 
In return, they are able to get credits. They're able to sell about 2,250 tons of carbon per year, and they get about 12,000 US dollars. So this money, uh, we have got the Association for Coastal Ecosystem, that is a Scottish charity organization that acts as link uh, between our Mikoko Pomoja organization and the voluntary carbon market. So this money, once it comes from the voluntary carbon buyers, then 6% is retained uh, by the access to enhance verification. That is independent verifiers come from, from the plan vivo and do verification. And then 94% is distributed uh, to the community members. So they sit down and then they decide like what do they want to do. So some of the money is used uh, to enhance like water projects in the community to help uh, in building the schools, buy books, as well as uh, help in buying furniture for the dispensary, things that benefit the community as a whole. So uh, in the future, the, we are hoping, some of the voluntary carbon buyers include the Caprio Foundation, uh, Edinburgh Napi University, uh, we have got uh, Tropimundo Foundation or program. And then uh, we, the project has currently been replicated in Vanga, that is about 50 kilometers from Mombasa city. And then we are also looking forward to uh, bundling seagrass ecosystems into the mangrove carbon uh, offsetting scheme. So we hope that with the replication of these, uh, we shall continue enhancing mangrove functionality as well as improving community livelihood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asante Gabriel. It's, it's been really, really inspiring. And again, you've displayed a, a concrete example of how to combine carbon, max, man, carbon markets, apologies, um, the restoration of mangroves, the protection of ecosystems, and obviously uh, benefits to local communities. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now to, to go on with our lighting round of speakers, let's, uh, let's continue with our last uh, speaker, Brent Smith. Thank you, Brent, for being here with us. You are the co-founder and executive director of Green Wave, which is an award-winning organization that supports a new generation of ocean farmers. So you have pioneered the development of 3D ocean farming and contributed to rethinking aquaculture. So we definitely want to hear more about this. Uh, over to you, Brent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Such an honor to be here. I think I'm the lowest on the food chain in terms of education and, and intelligence, but a, a real honor to, to be here. So, um, you know, um, I think of this, I'm not really an environmentalist per se. I think of the nexus between climate change, jobs, and community uh, benefit. And so, and, and that's sort of been the trajectory of my life. I dropped, I'm from Newfoundland, Canada. I dropped out of high school when I was 14 and became a commercial fisherman and fished the globe. But then 30,000 people were thrown out of work in my, in, in my area because the cod stocks crashed. And that's when I realized as a fisherman, there weren't going to be any jobs on a dead planet, on a dead ocean. Right? And that, that really um, set off a, a, a trajectory of, of how can I work and collaborate with the ocean, be a steward on it so that I can make a living in the future. So I went on this search for sustainability um, and experimented many, many failures for, for about 20 years and slowly developed a polyculture system uh, that creates jobs, mitigates climate change, and feeds uh, uh, communities. Here's a picture um, of, the, of the farm. Um, you can imagine sort of, you know, it's, it's, under, it's underwater. You've got ropes on the side of the farm. I mean, ropes and anchors that go vertically up and then horizontally across is where we grow our crops, sort of an underwater scaffolding system. Um, and the idea here is because we're vertical, we have a small footprint but can grow a huge amount of food. I used to have a hundred acre farm, I'm down to 20 and growing more food than before. And its simplicity is its power um, uh, because the ocean wants you to be a willow, not an oak. You just wanna give with the ocean and then go up in the surface. You don't wanna be pens, cages, things like that because uh, the ocean is an unfriend, unfriendly. And then um, go to the uh, next slide. Just pop over, yeah. So. The idea is to grow as many species in these 20 acres as possible, concentrating on species that you that that don't swim uh, and and um, you don't have to feed. So that's the kelp up in the corner, one of the fastest growing plants in the world. And it's a winter crop, so it's off season for many fishermen and post hurricane. 
We have our muscles, which are lean proteins packed full of omega-3s, a lower carbon footprint than lentils, and then oysters um, uh, and uh, scallops there. Just next slide. And that's the farm from the surface. And there's kind of nothing to see, and that's a good thing, right? Our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places, and we want to keep them that way. Um, anybody can boat and fish on my farm. Some of the best fishing in our whole area is on the farm because it runs as an ecosystem. And it's really our job as farmers to protect um, the ocean commons and um, uh, sort of not, not be on the front lines of, pri of privatization. So the reason I think this is especially important uh, for us is one, it's regenerative. Just like land-based farming being regenerative, this is regenerative food production. So it's zero inputs, so no water, you know, fresh water, no fertilizer, no feeds, no use of land, making it the most sustainable food on the planet, but also capturing uh, carbon. The oysters filter 50 gallons of water a day, so sequestering nitrogen. We rebuild reefs. So as a fisherman, I'm not depleting the ecosystem, I'm breathing life back uh, into the ocean. Second, it's replicable, right? Um, these are very cheap to build. So if you have 20 acres of boat and $20,000, you can get started and start your own farm. And that's really important. So regular folks can me, like me can get into, into the industry and you don't have to be a large corporation and you can net up to about $100,000, which is a good middle class uh, job here. And this low barrier to entry allows for fast replication, which we need in the climate era. We, era, we can spread farms very quickly. Last, it's scalable. And this is key. It can't be boutique. I, the World Bank says if you farm less than 5% of just U.S. waters, you create 50 million jobs and the protein equivalent of 3 trillion burgers. We need to think big, but we don't need to think 1,000-acre farms. We can think of networks of small and medium-scale farms, uh, sort of a reef system, um, dotting our co coastlines, processing hubs, hatcheries, rings of entrepreneurs, and then you replicate those reefs. Um, now to scale the farms, we also need to scale markets. And people always ask like, who's gonna uh, use and eat this seaweed? We like seaweed, especially because of its diverse uh, uses. Shellfish is easy to sell for us. Um, seaweed, it's been a learning curve, but it's such a diverse, it's like the soy of the sea, but not evil. So my kelp this year off of my farm went into tobacco barns to be dry uh, during the COVID era. Then uh, it went to food, specifically plant-based burgers and kelp flowers. So we wove it into these other industries. It was turned into bioplastics because we have some amazing bioplastics that use uh, companies that use seaweeds to create straws and plastics. And think how amazing this is, right? We're growing these uh, crops underwater and addresses the plastic uh, issue in the ocean. Um, and then finally for fertilizer and feed. So we collect the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus in the water with our seaweeds and then we get them into the soil for land-based regenerative farmers to sequester that. The trouble with blue carbon is if you eat the seaweed, you don't have a drawdown effect. You have an avoided carbon uh, benefit, but you're not, you're not sequestering. So we get it in, into the soil. Now, of course, also, if you look at the farms as a whole, we're able to do food, byproducts, but also these ecosystem services like uh, blue carbon, nitrogen, and, and fourth, data harvesting, using the farms as data uh, platforms and selling that data. And this diverse kind of species, diverse markets, and diverse communities doing this, I think is the secret to climate resiliency. Just to close, Greenway, my organization, is a nonprofit. Its goal is to train 10,000 farmers in the next 10 years. We have a social justice focus of training fishermen directly affected by climate change and indigenous community communities. It's hands-on training. We're in seven states as well as New Zealand. Uh, we do hands-on and then digital platforms with toolkits and collaboration. Um, and that's kind of what, what is exciting for us here is that we can build an economy for the bottom up that doesn't look like the industrial agricultural economy, right? And doesn't look like industrial aquaculture, but it's something better, more beautiful. It's not privatizing seed, regular people can do it. And that's exciting for me because the goal there is how, how do folks from my community make a living on a living planet? So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Bren. It's been absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and you're right, uh, the bottom-up approach is absolutely needed. Uh, we need to have all actors of society involved. And thank you for in your, your innovation. Thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, it's, it's been truly, uh, truly inspiring. So we cannot stress enough, obviously, the, the link between the health of our ocean, the human health, food security, green jobs. So thank you. Thank you very much to this uh, 
incredible panel of, of speakers. I don't know about you, but I do feel truly inspired now. Um, I do want to go for a quick dive in the ocean as well, but you know that will have to wait for a few few weeks, months or so. But very unfortunately, we are getting to the end of our session. Um, but before we before we close, we're we're going to have two more speakers with us, uh, very high level speakers who have agreed to to stay on for the for the closing remarks so of this session on nature based solutions that the ocean can offer so please uh, can we get the the other speakers on i can see you're on stage perfect on stage on the screen um for first let me hand over to dr Gemma harper Gemma, you are deputy director for marine policy and evidence at defro in the uk of course we know that the uk holds the cop 26 presidency and has great ambition uh, to further push the ocean and climate nexus. So thank you very much, Gemma, for being here. We know you, you're extremely busy, so please, the, the floor is, is yours. Thank you so much, Lola. Lovely to see you uh, again. And, and thank you to our friends at World Economic Forum for hosting this really important event and for inviting me to join you. And thank you also to this incredibly impressive panel of speakers. I'm really heartened and encouraged by your passion and your ambition for placing the ocean and nature-based solutions at the heart of action tackle climate change. And as you know, as we face the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss and deal with the impacts of COVID-19, now more than ever, events like these are absolutely vital to bring us together and unite us in common cause. It reminds me that no matter the scale of the challenges ahead, we can only overcome them by working in unison across all sectors of government, industry and society. We know that the ocean has long been our silent ally, naturally absorbing and locking away carbon from the atmosphere and acting as a buffer to the devastating effects of climate change. But we also know that the ocean can't do this indefinitely. We must be the voice for the ocean. As we know, the ocean supports the livelihoods of one in every 10 people, including some of the poorest and most vulnerable on Earth. Sea levels are rising, threatening the homes and communities of over 600 million people living in coastal areas. We know the ocean is becoming warmer, more acidic, in fact, creating an existential threat to coral reefs that millions of people rely on for their coastal protection and for their food, not to speak of the biodiversity that depends on them. Last year, COP25 marked a step change in raising the profile of the ocean within UNFCCC. And we saw the first COP decision specifically on the ocean, and it was a real honour and privilege to be there for that in Madrid. As the incoming COP26 presidency, in partnership with Italy, we are championing the role of nature-based solutions to address the global challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss. Today's event is a real opportunity to reflect on how we will continue to raise the profile of the ocean in strengthening mitigation, adaptation and resilience in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The COVID-19 pandemic has further highlighted the critical role of nature as we appreciate more than ever the links between the health of society and the health of the natural world. And so I'm extremely grateful to the speakers today for highlighting the collaborative action that we can all take to invest in a greater, greener, and yes, bluer, resilient recovery. We strongly recognize the links between healthy and diverse marine ecosystems, our global capacity for adaptation, and the resilient recovery we need. So the United Kingdom is championing a new target to protect at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030, to be agreed, CBD next year. Along with fellow members of the Global Ocean Alliance, we warmly encourage you to join us. 36% of UK waters are already in MPAs, and our government is currently considering its response to the recent Benyon review on highly protected marine areas, including the role of blue carbon habitats to improve climate resilience of our seas. And we will continue to invest in, develop and take action on world leading science to underpin effective decision making. As we know, 2021 kicks off the UN decades of ocean science for sustainable development and of ecosystem restoration, and both are a critical part of this endeavor. We will work with the UN decades driving forward science 
for equitable solutions, capacity building and meaningful action. We know that nature-based solutions could provide around a third of cost-effective solutions we need right now, yet they attract only 3% of global climate finance. So we're committed to doubling our international climate finance and we'll be spending a significant part of that uplift on nature. Additionally, using the UK's 500 million Blue Planet Fund, we will work with developing countries to help protect their marine resources from key human generated threats, including climate change and habitat loss. But we must mobilize resources on all fronts, public and private, if we are to meet our ambition with the action needed. So in conclusion, the pathway to net zero, meeting our sustainable development goals and delivering against an ambitious global biodiversity framework can only be achieved by protecting and conserving nature on a massive scale. 2021 is the start of a decade of ocean opportunity. And I agree with what others have already said today. We must make this a decade of action. I'm inspired by what we've seen and heard today. And I personally am filled with ocean optimism for 2021. I hope you are too. I look forward to working together to maintain this momentum, our ambition, and to driving real world action on nature-based solutions for the ocean, for climate, for nature and for us. Thank you, Lola. Thank you so much, Gemma. Your, your words were extremely inspiring. Thank you for your personal commitment into this. We've been working together for many years, so I know how dedicated you are. Thank you. Thank you also for the leadership of the of the UK in this in this endeavor, obviously. Um, we cannot wait, at least I can't wait, to be at COP26 in Glasgow, although it will be in November and cold, but we will be there to defend the ocean climate biodiversity nexus. And um, in the meantime, yeah, we will definitely follow your words to keep the momentum going for both ocean and, and climate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now let's bring on our final speaker, uh, another true ocean champion, Ambassador Peter Thompson. You are the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thompson, for being here with us today. And please, I give you the virtual floor for final remarks. Thank you for that, uh, Lorelei. <clears throat> uh, if you can hear me, just give me a thumbs up. Very good. So uh, apologies for joining late. Uh, I uh, jumped out of a meeting of the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, which is um, uh, nearing the end now. And, but I did come in at the beginning of Bryn's um, presentation. Uh, apologies to the other presenter, presenters. But Bryn, all I can say to you, man, is just keep spreading that message. It is so inspiring. I, I really feel lifted by what uh, you presented there. So greetings to everyone, and thanks for your attention to this really vital subject. You know, in the Pacific Islands, we've long been saying that the ocean change and climate change uh, issues must not be separated in the interests of bureaucratic processes. It's long been obvious to us that their connection is too intricately entwined for them to be dealt with in siloed processes. Thus, it's really good to see that our calls for a more integrated approach are now being heard and acted upon. As you know, the considerable progress uh, that is being made within the UNFCCC's processes for recognition of the ocean's role in regulating the global climate system are now being recognized. And I look forward to participating early next month in the Substa Ocean Climate Dialogue. But in my experience of multilateral processes, Vigilance will be required if the ocean's legitimate interest and its hard-won place at the table are to ma be maintained. Political power resides in terrestrially focused organizations and governments. And until nature is given the vote, that will always be the case. Here, let me note that if nature were to be given the vote, the ocean would indeed prevail for an estimated 50 to 80% of all life on planet Earth is found under the ocean's surface. I won't preach to the choir here by setting out all of the solutions the ocean offers for both uh, adaptation and mitigation in the face of the climate crisis. Marine ecosystems offer a myriad of nature-based solutions to tackle climate crisis. And you've already covered some of those and most of those, I guess, in your discussions today. So let me just emphasize again that protection of marine ecosystems will allow the ocean to carry on its role as the great regulator of climate. That is one of the chief reasons we pursue SDG 14's implementation so rigorously. 
For were we to ignore the ocean's role, we would do so at our peril. Should we allow its health to continue its current decline through habitat destruction, and rampant pollution, and harmful fisheries policies and practices, the ocean's ability to perform that great role would steadily diminish, and life on planet Earth would suffer in untold ways. So I say again, no healthy planet without a healthy ocean. Anthropogenic greenhouse gases. The expression just rolls off our tongue too easily these days. The poor old dinosaurs didn't have the luxury of extinction foresight. They had no chance to spread the words, look out everyone, there's a massive meteor heading our way. In our case, the best of human science has made it very clear to us, and we cannot unknow this, that anthropogenic greenhouse gases building up since the commencement of the industrial age have been heating our planet, and in the process have been acidifying the ocean, deoxygenating it, and warming it, causing such global marine phenomena as rising sea levels and the death of coral. Make no mistake, the ocean climate nexus is at the crux of human security on this planet, and no one who cares for the future of our children and grandchildren should underestimate that fact. We are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Big governments, big economies, big polluters are seeing that light. They've begun to appreciate that their futures are at risk. One by one, they're joining the race to zero. One by one, they're committing to a world of net zero carbon. One by one, they're accepting that the choice of blue-green recovery is the smart choice. The United Nations, and yes, that's all of us, the multilateral global community of we the peoples is at the forefront of the race to zero. We've stood together for the Paris Climate Agreement and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We have, through the UN family of UNFCCC and WMO and IOC, UNESCO, UNEP, FAO, UNDP, and so many other agencies and programs, never resile from the great challenges of the 21st century, chief amongst which is the deterioration of conditions for life on this planet. The UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development gets underway next year, as does the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. Prepare yourselves for the good works ahead and be a part of them. Above all, do not lose faith in the ability of humanity to create a world of net zero carbon by 2050. After all, it was the in ingenuity of humankind that in the face of wars and droughts and famines and natural disasters and pandemics, always carried us through. From the Stone Age to the Space Age, in the face of crisis, we have shown that our powers of innovation are prodigious. We know that we are facing crisis now as never before in the shape of loss of biodiversity, a deteriorating ocean, and climate change. We know that anthropogenic greenhouse gases are our chief enemy. And we have the opportunity in 2021 to set about a campaign to turn the tide against them. That campaign embraces biodiversity's demise, which we'll tackle at the CBD conference in Kunming, along with the ocean's decline, for which we'll find solutions at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. And both of these waves of committed action will then converge on Glasgow in November at the UNFCCC's COP26 to create there the great wave of change required. We now have a real opportunity to establish a regular work stream to address ocean climate issues within the UNFCCC's work. So let us take the current while it serves. Dear colleagues, my basic message to you on this journey is to commit firmly to the case for it's rational, it's just, and it is central to the blue-green future in whose cause we are working. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thompson. As, as usual, your, your passion and optimism is lifting us all. And, uh, and we are committed in that race to zero and we will be uh, jointly active towards COP26. Um, as I've mentioned, now we have reached uh, the end of our session on fighting climate change and the ocean as part of the solution.